on June 25th, 1967, at the height of the Vietnam War, renowned BBC producer Aubrey Singer put together the first ever live international satellite television production. I know this doesn't sound like a big deal to you who live in the Facebook Live generation where you can broadcast to India with a few swipes of your finger on your smartphone. But 50 years ago, executing this type of collaborative production was at the cutting edge of innovation. In a two and a half hour live event entitled Our World, 14 countries participated in broadcasting various segments to upwards of 700 million people worldwide. This is the largest television audience to that point in history. Now, the most famous segment uh, in the entire show was the debut of a song by the Beatles. For the show, the Beatles were asked to perform a song that had a message that could easily be understood by everyone who would be watching from around the world. And so they performed the song that went something like this. Let's give them a hand. All You Need Is Love became an instant hit. The song connected with just about everyone who heard it, and its simple message encapsulated the deepest desire in every person. And the song, which is still popular to this day, has certainly become an icon. In describing the song, the band's manager said it was an inspired song and they really wanted to give the world a message. The nice thing about the song is that it cannot be misinterpreted. It is a clear message saying that love is everything. Love is everything. Now, the sentiment is where we find ourselves in our passage today in the Song of Songs. In the Song of Songs, we are given insight into how we ought to celebrate marriage and approach sexual pleasure within it. In a compilation of love poems, we see how God celebrates the marital intimacy between a husband and wife. We also see cautions throughout the book to be mindful of and guard against the ways love may be awakened before its time. But essentially, we see how sexual intimacy and love are good things. Actually, we see how they are great things, but how they are great things intended for marriage. Now, I'm very aware that most of you in here are not married. So if you're here wondering what does a book about love, marriage, and sex have to do with me right now, I want you to know that this message is for you as well. Now, whether you're married or single, and whether you get married or stay single, and let me make it clear that singleness is no second-class status to God, the, I, the Song of Songs gives us something to celebrate about God's design for exclusive love and a window into the sexual intimacy that can be had in marriage. But it also gives us a window into the intensity of God's love for which and from which human love finds its source. Now, over the course of this book, we track the blossoming romance of uh, of a marriage between a man and a woman. Over and over throughout this book, we are given glimpses into the growing and maturing passionate romance that these two lovers uh, had as they did not kiss dating goodbye, but they did court, get married, and consummate their love. With love, commitment, passion, romance, and sexual intimacy between a husband and a wife serving as the backdrop to our passage today, we see how this love and commitment and passion highlighted between this husband and wife points us to an even greater reality surrounding love. As I mentioned, the Song of Songs gives us a window into the intensity of God's love out of which an intense human love finds its source. So if you have your Bibles, keep them open to Song of Songs, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Now, in verse 6 of this passage, we see the woman imploring the man to take full possession of her. Like a sprinter who has but one goal, to win the race, this woman has but a singular focus. 
She wants him to have all of her and for her to be able to have all of him as she asks him to set him, set her as a seal upon his heart, to set her as a seal upon his arm. Now, a seal is a sign of ownership, and, this, and in the days that this was written, seals were pressed into soft clay like the handprints in wet cement that kids cannot help but leave an impression in. And the seal or the impression indicated to whom the object belonged. A seal signified possession over the thing marked by it. It was the ancient equivalent to a modern-day signature. A signature on a contract or a credit card slip indicates who is responsible for what. The signature indicates ownership. Now, we don't use seals in the United States, but they're still common in several countries uh, around the world, inclu including Korea. And in Korean, they're called dojangs, or stamps. I actually have two seals here with me from Korea. One belongs to me and one belongs to my wife. Uh, we don't use them for official purposes, but, but we got them made because it's something unique to our ethnic and cultural background. Now, each seal is made of a precious stone, and since my wife and I uh, got them after we got married, we, we, got the, we got a set of seals designed specifically for couples. Now, I know it's super cheesy, but each seal makes up one half of a tree, and when they are together, they complete the tree. Uh, but what makes the seal meaningful is what is engraved at the bottom. The seals have our names on them, identifying us as the responsible owners. I, if we use them uh, for official purposes, what this means is that it would, uh, it, would re it would hold us responsible for the contents of the documents that bore our names. Now, this means that if it were assigned to a debt, that the debt... Uh, and the seal upon the debt would indicate that the debt is ours. But it also means that if it was assigned to a bank account full of cash, that the entire bank account that bore our seals would belong to us. Again, the seal indicates ownership. So when you place your seal on something, you are declaring your ownership over it. And in some ways, this is what the woman is asking of the man. By asking him to, to place a seal over his heart and his arm, she is saying, let me mark your heart and let me mark your arm. Taken together, the heart and the arm signifies that she wants all of him. She wants him completely. The heart indicates the internal life and the arm indicates the external life. In other words, she's asking him to let her be his everything. She wants complete possession over his private and public commitment to her. She's not willing to settle for anything less. She wants him in an exclusively undivided manner all to herself. Can you imagine this scene? Can you imagine how vulnerable and exposed she must have been feeling as she was pleading with him to set her as a seal upon his heart and as a seal upon his arm, to let her be his everything, to be his all in all? This is like next level stuff to asking your CFA on a date. But as C.S. Lewis wrote, to love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the, in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will become, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. For to love is to be broke, it's to be vulnerable. Now, one of the most vulnerable moments of my life was uh, when I actually proposed to my wife, Jessica. It was the oddest feeling I ever had. Uh, I knew she was going to say yes. We'd already gone ring shopping. We'd already talked to her parents and gotten their blessing. We'd already set the venue. But for some reason, when I got down on one knee and was looking up at her, I felt completely vulnerable. I felt naked. I felt exposed. I felt helpless. And I felt like I was at the complete mercy of a woman who was completely out of my league. I don't know what it was, but the space between the question, will you marry me, and her response 
felt like an absolute eternity. But in reality, it couldn't have been more than a couple seconds. It felt vulnerable because at that point, I was pleading with her to make a personal and public commitment to love me until death do us part. I was asking her to set me as a seal upon her heart and her arm, or more specifically, her fourth finger on her left hand. In some ways, this is what wedding rings signify. They signify the type of seal that the woman in the Song of Songs is asking to mark her lover with. By wearing the ring, we say we belong in mind and heart, in body and soul, to another. And with this request to have him place her as a seal over his heart and his arm, our female protagonist in the Song of Songs demonstrates the desire for her love to be reciprocated and completed. You see, this woman's desire for love reflects the desire all of us have. Though in the Song of Songs, this love is reflected in the nature of a romantic and, dare I say, erotic love, the woman shares with the man, this desire for love is not exclusive to marriage. This desire for love reaches far beyond a romantic relationship, which means this book, whether you are married or not, is for anyone who would venture to open its sultry pages. As we read in the rest of verse 6, we, we, we come across these words. Love is as strong as death. It's jealousy as unyielding as the grave. The woman tells us love is as strong as death, and its jealousy does not yield to any rival. Benjamin Franklin is attributed with a statement that goes, in this world, nothing can be certain, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Yet our leading lady here in the Song of Song claims that love is as certain as both. Who doesn't want to be loved with a love as powerful as death? All of us desire a undivided, and a, a undivided love and a love that cannot be broken. We all want a love that is unchangeable and reliable. We all have a desire to experience love. It is what our hearts yearn for. We all want to be loved beyond measure in a way that reminds us of how radically accepted we are. This is the deepest desire of our soul. This, the soul's deepest desire is to be loved, but we know that we cannot truly be loved unless we are truly known. Whether you want to admit it or not, each and every person in here has a deep desire to be known and to be loved. But if you're like me, you are afraid that if you are known, you won't be loved. For you are afraid that once you are exposed, you'll be rejected. However, when you push away the fears of rejection, and you push away the hurt of the past, and when you take away the facade, and you arrive at the rawest yearnings of your heart, I think you can admit to your desire to be loved in a way that makes you feel known and loved and known in a way and known in a way that makes you feel loved. You want this because we all have a desire to be loved with a love that is stronger than death. As Tim Keller wrote, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is well a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us from out of our self-righteousness, and it fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. There is great comfort in knowing that you are loved as you are known. Nothing can liberate you, free you, and fill you like this can, for nothing is as powerful as love is. And in the Song of Songs 8 and 6 and 7, this is the truth we are confronted with. In verses 6 and 7, we are confronted with, with, with the immense power of love. We see here that love is more powerful than death, that love is more powerful than waters over a fire, and that love is more powerful than money and wealth. It's as if the writer wanted to set up the greatest contenders to take on the champ in order to prove that no one could take the title. The first contender is death, which we already know cannot hold a candle to love. Starting with the metaphor of death, we are told that love is stronger than death. Despite the certainty of death, love takes the fight. First round, knockout. 
Then we are told that love burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame, which sounds eerily similar to Muhammad Ali's float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. We are told that love burns so hotly that even water cannot quench the blazing and mighty flame of love, as we read in verse 6, as that many waters cannot quench love, rivers cannot sweep it away. Love goes two for two. And then finally, we witness the third bout against money and wealth. Verse 7 concludes, if one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. Now, some of us in here think that if we were just rich enough, we could have and buy the love of others. Now, money may buy many things, but it cannot buy love. Love will never throw the fight. True love cannot be bought. So we witness a TKO, a total knockout, and love goes undefeated. The woman places the power of death, the power of fire, of a fire that cannot be quenched by water, and even the power of money and wealth against the power and love, a power of love, and love prevails every time. Nothing is as powerful as love. As Francis Schaeffer once said, love is the final apologetic. Love is the defense for which there is no defense. During the 17th century, Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of England, how you like that title, sentenced a soldier to be shot for his crimes. The execution was to take place at the ringing of the evening curfew bell. However, the bell did not sound. The soldier's fiance had somehow climbed into the belfry and clung to the great clapper of the bell, preventing it from striking. When she was caught, she was summoned by Cromwell to account for her actions. And as she did, she wept as she showed her bruised and bleeding hands. Lord Cromwell's heart was touched. And he said, your lover shall live because of your love for him. Now, we love stories like this, don't we? We love stories that lift our hearts. We love stories of ideal marriages and families, friendships and the power of love that show the world how things ought to be. We love ideal romances like the one portrayed in the Song of Songs because they are both aspirational and inspirational. Yet, if we were honest with ourselves, we know that even the best of human love falls short. If you live long enough, you know that love doesn't only grow. It often ebbs and flows. Sometimes it fades out. Sometimes it disappears into thin air. Even the best marriages are full of conflict and challenges, strife and suffering. And sometimes it feels like love loses. Sometimes it feels like love is the weakest contender in the ring. For as many stories that are inspiring of love that you encounter, you have 10 that you know are, dis are, are even more discouraging. And for every story of triumph, it feels like there are stacks full of failures. Marriages are not often the happily ever afters we had hoped for. Friendships are the source of pain instead of a place of comfort. Relationships end, churches split, communities divide, and people go their separate ways. Even when we try to put, our, our, to, put, to put all of our efforts into preserving the, 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 the relationship, it seems like our best efforts fall short. As great as the best of human love was, in many ways, we know that it will never live up to the expectations we want to place upon it. This is the way it is because the created things cannot be, that cannot, because created things cannot sustain the soul's need for the creator himself. C.S. Lewis once wrote that the books or the music in which that we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust them. It was not in them, it only came through them, and what came through them was longing. These, these things, the beauty, the memory of our own past are good images of what we really desire, but if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself, they are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have 
yet heard, we, have not yet, we have not heard. News from a country we have never yet visited. And as the often cited Augustine quote goes, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. As amazing as human love is, whether it's in the context of marriage like this, this, like this, like this book displays or in any other context, it doesn't quite match up to divine love. And so the Song of Songs ends abruptly, leaving the reader wanting more. If you turn to the end of the book, you will find that there is no resolution. It leaves us suspended in midair. We are left with a cliffhanger. On the one hand, it shows us how true love is endless and keeps us wanting more of it. The more we experience love, the more we want to experience love. But on the other hand, it shows us how love in this world will not be able to fully satisfy the deepest parts of our soul. But we know based on the entirety of the Bible that although human love will not find absolute and complete fulfillment in this life, those who are in Christ will certainly find it in the, in the eternity that awaits them. As this book ends without resolve, we know that love goes on. But we also know that we find resolution when we are face to face with Jesus Christ. This is why the book doesn't end with a climax, but with anticipation for more. For one day, you will be in the unveiled presence of God, and you will see that the deepest yearning of your heart to be known as you desire to be known and to be loved as you desire to be loved will find its completion in the presence of God. Until that day, you need not fear, you need not fret, you need not worry, and you need not dread, for you can live in the full knowledge that God's love for you is as strong as death, and it's jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Amen.